If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts, Acts uh, chapter 15 this evening, Acts 15, and um, we are obviously in that uh, second section of the book of Acts, we, the book of Acts divided into two, uh, two major divisions, and uh, the first half of the book is uh, primarily Jewish, and it shows the offer of the kingdom of heaven to the nation of Israel, uh, the second go-around. And uh, then, of course, Paul gets saved in that transition period there in chapter 9. And we've said that chapter 9, 10, and 11 are the apex of the transition book. Uh, Acts is a transition book, and there's no other way. There's no way to understand it other than that. And then the the very apex of that transition is chapter nine, ten, and eleven. Chapter nine, Saul of Tarsus gets converted. In chapter ten, Peter is sent to Cornelius, a Gentile. Chapter eleven, he goes back and rehearses this and gives an account. And then uh, in uh, chapter and, and, it, and I should include chapter 12 in that as well, because chapter 13 is the beginning of that second uh, division where uh, Paul and Barnabas are called by the Holy Spirit to go on their first missionary journey. And uh, <clears throat> so tonight we want to look at chapter 15 in the book of Acts. This is one of the most important uh, chapters in the book uh, because it deals with this problem of uh, Judaism and it just simply serves to, uh, to confirm that Judaism is being set aside, the law was set aside, and uh, that the Gentiles are not under the law. And we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, Peter uh, was confronted earlier uh, when he, in, in Jer by those in Jerusalem after he'd made his vi visit to Cornelius there in chapter 10. And chapter 11 was that confrontation. And uh, when Peter came back in chapter 11 and rehearsed what had happened at, uh, in Caesarea, how that he was speaking and the Holy Ghost fell on the Gentiles, those that heard the word of God, and God had granted to them the Holy Spirit. And of course, uh, Peter had with him six brethren, Jewish brethren, who confirmed his testimony. Uh, when the Jews back at Jerusalem heard the full story, they were glad, the Bible says. It says they were glad that God had granted repentance to the Gentiles. Now, God granted repentance to the Gentiles. I don't have time to talk about that, but it's talking about the Gentile nations. Uh, prior to this, the Gentile nations uh, were required to come to God through the nation of Israel. But now, God has granted repentance to them. Uh, they, could, they could now come to God without the aid of Judaism, without uh, the ministry of Israel. Uh, God had granted a favor to, to the Gentile nations. Um, the, uh, the time of the Gentiles began uh, there in about uh, uh, in, uh, when... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in and carried away uh, the captives when is Jerusalem was destroyed and the Babylonian captivity started that 70 years. And uh, from that time to this, Israel ceased to be a favored nation. They were set aside and the times of the Gentiles began. But uh, still a Jew, still a Jew, or still a Gentile uh, had to come to God uh, as a Jewish proselyte. And if they were going to be part of the millennial kingdom. And, uh, but at this point in Acts chapter 10, that all changed or was beginning to change and started to change. And so now repentance was granted to the Gentiles without the aid of the Jews and without them becoming Jewish proselytes. Something absolutely unheard of had taken place. And uh, so when the Jews heard that, there in Jerusalem, they were glad. There was a church started at Antioch as a result of the uh, dispersion or the scattering uh, of the uh, believers because of the persecution uh, 
of, of Saul of Tarsus, and Stephen, of course, had been stoned, and, and uh, they, they, the Bible says they scattered. They went everywhere preaching the gospel to none but Jews only. But uh, finally, there was a church started there in Antioch, a Gentile uh, city, and its numbers grew, and it was a mixed congregation. It had within it Jews and Gentiles. And uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas, of course, were called to minister in that church. They needed teachers, and they needed uh, helpers to minister. So Paul and Barnabas went there, and they worked for quite a while. And as they ministered, the Holy Ghost instructed them to take the gospel of the grace of God to the Gentiles. And after returning from a very successful missionary trip, which we dealt with last Thursday night, uh, they found out that uh, <clears throat> there was some trouble in the church when they got back. They'd left the church a while, and they came back to trouble. And uh, you can bet on that. When a pastor or a missionary leaves his field for any length of time, he's going to come back to trouble, usually. Usually that's what will happen. And so they came back, and the Bible says they abode there a long time. Now here in chapter uh, here in chapter 15, uh, when it says in verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, watch this, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. You see that? Here were folks coming down from Judea and Jerusalem, and they were teaching these believers at Antioch, saying, Unless you be circumcised, and keep the law of Moses. You may have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ well and good, but you still have to keep the law of Moses. So at some point in time, while Paul and Barnabas were gone on this first missionary trip, men came down from Judea, and they came to this church at Antioch, and they taught these believers that circumcision and the keeping of the law of Moses was necessary for their salvation. In other words, it was necessary if they were going to be saved, according to verse 1. And... Uh, and, you know, this was a subtle attempt. This all was a subtle attempt to bring the Gentile believers under bondage to uh, and the control of the Jews. And that's, that's as old as time. And uh, this statement here in verses 1 and 2, these comments, these uh, 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 requirements, they went exactly contrary to what, uh, what Peter had reported back at Jerusalem. And uh, <clears throat> this was an attempt, as I said, to bring them under bondage. And it was a direct contradiction to Peter's testimony concerning the Gentiles. And if true, if it was true that they had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, then this teaching would nullify all that Paul and Barnabas had ever done. Their efforts would have been in vain. And uh, so this teaching could not be overlooked. This was not a small matter. And in fact, it said, when look at verse 2, when Paul and Barnabas had no small uh, dissension and uh, uh, disputation about them, they determined to go. So when you don't have a small issue, you have a lot, great issue. And the, basically, Paul and Barnabas got in their face over this issue. They couldn't allow this kind of teaching to continue. It was contrary to what the Holy Spirit had just revealed, both to Peter and to the Apostle Paul. So the teaching was destructive to the unity of this church, this Gentile church. So it could not be ignored. Now, not being not sure where it originated, Paul and Barnabas uh, knew the truth, and they determined to go up to Jerusalem about this matter. Look at verse 2. And this they did, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small uh, dissension and disputation with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other men should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So this question created such a stir in that uh, Gentile church that Paul and Barnabas says, we're not going to let this stand. We're not going to sweep, sweep this under the carpet. We're going to go right up to Jerusalem and we're going to confront them on this issue. And so it's interesting as Paul and Barnabas traveled in verse 3, uh, you'll notice that they stayed the course. Paul and Barnabas... Uh, uh, I think it's interesting, even though they had this great problem in their mind, and they were headed straight for Jerusalem to deal with it, they not only did that, but they, they stopped by Gentile churches. And they reported how God was saving Gentiles. In other words, they didn't let this issue cloud the blessing and hinder them from establishing these 
other churches and telling the Gentile, the Jewish churches in Judea what God was doing. And in verse 3, notice how it brought joy. And being brought on their way by the churches, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria. Notice what they did. They declared the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto the brethren. So you know, even when you have a problem, you, you, you certainly can still be positive and, and be a blessing to people and report what God is doing. I mean, all is not lost, you see. They weren't just so occupied with this problem that they failed to recognize the needs of these Christians as they traveled back. And that's so important. Sometimes we get so fixed on a problem and so preoccupied by it that we can't be used to be a blessing to anybody. And I, you know, I've been guilty of that and I'd like to get over it. You pray for me. Now they arrived at Jerusalem. And then, and after, look at verse 5. And after the formalities and a report on what God was doing among the Gentiles, the Pharisees who had believed on the Lord Jesus Christ stated that it was necessary for Gentile converts to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. In verse 5, but there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, notice, which believed. Now, I, I don't know. Maybe these guys were saved. These are Pharisees. At least they profess to believe. And uh, they had believed that Jesus was the Christ, but they said it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And uh, <clears throat> so all I know is what the text says. It says they believed and uh, that they were teaching false doctrine here. And, uh, and at this time, a private meeting took place. And uh, uh, the disciples met together with Paul and Barnabas and Peter and a few others. And that meeting is referred to in verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. So this first meeting was not with the full church assembly. The, the apostles and the brethren got together and they said, Men, we need to talk about this. And this is exactly what they did. Now, if you go to the book of Galatians, Paul talks about, about this meeting. And uh, he, uh, <clears throat> I'm confident that this is the meeting he's talking about. In Galatians chapter 2 and down about verse, uh, verse 4. In 2.4, he talks about this meeting, and he says that we met in private, and he says that because of false brethren, uh, unawares brought in. So not only were these Pharisees there who professed to believe, who taught that you must be circumcised, you keep the law of Moses, but evidently there were false brethren who, who came in. And he says, what did they do? They came in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. What's the pur purpose, Paul? What was their intent? Well, he tells you in Galatians uh, chapter 2 and verse 4 and 5. He says, They came in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. Watch it. That they might bring us into bondage. Bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, not so much as an hour. We didn't, give, we didn't, we didn't uh, subject ourselves to these birds at all. We did not give them any acknowledgement. We didn't shake hands with them and say it was a good debate. Uh, we wouldn't give them any time. We wouldn't give them the time of day is what he's saying. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So here we have Paul and Barnabas. They've returned from their first missionary trip. They come back to Antioch. They realize that their church has been infiltrated by some false teaching. These, Jew, these Gentile believers, you can just imagine the, uh, the, the, the trouble and the anxiety that must have been in their heart. So Paul and Barnabas headed right straight for Jerusalem. And on the way they stopped and they stopped at some churches and they reported how God was blessing and saving Gentiles. And that was an encouragement to these churches. And then they went on down to Jerusalem. There were the disciples. There was Peter. They had a private conference because some false brethren had been brought in. And their purpose was to spy out and try to find fault and just to create more havoc. So they got together. Now, evidently, now they move out into the congregation, and Simon Peter is the first person to speak. And Peter <clears throat> says to them, uh, you, you ought to notice, first of all, that it should be understood that the outcome of this meeting was planned of God. That is, this entire meeting here in Jerusalem was planned of God. Now, you may not remember a comment that I made some weeks ago. But when Simon Peter went and was, when Simon Peter saw the vision of the sheet let down from heaven, and he was told three times to go to Cornelius, 
And he took six men with him to be a testimony. And Peter is there preaching to Cornelius. He's really not preaching to him. He's just reporting on the life of Jesus Christ. And while he's doing that, without Peter's consent, without Peter's awareness of it, without any approval, the Holy Spirit of God descends on those Gentiles. They begin to speak in other languages. And everybody is astounded, astounded that this takes place. They marveled and, that God had done this. And so Peter says, fellows, these guys have received the Holy Spirit just as we did at the beginning. Who can forbid water that they should be baptized? And so they baptized them. They didn't lay hands on them. They didn't try to, they didn't, all he could do is say, let's baptize them. We don't have any other recourse. So when he goes back in chapter 11, he reports it. Now I said to you when that happened, that Simon Peter was, was, was being used for evidence at a later time that God was turning from the Jews as a nation and raising up the Apostle Paul and confirming Paul's ministry and turning to the Gentiles. Now then, Simon Peter is the first spokesman and he uses that bit of evidence that took place back there in chapter 10 just as I told you he would. And so it needs to be understood that the outcome of this meeting here in chapter 15 was planned by God when he called Simon Peter back there in chapter 10. And that was the very reason God selected Peter to go to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. The means and the outcome of this meeting would be the key to establishing Paul's ministry to the Gentiles in the eyes of all. I'll say it again. The means and the outcome of this meeting would be the key to establishing Paul's ministry to the Gentiles in the eyes of all. It needs to be stated that Paul was not receiving authority or commission from this church at Jerusalem. That had already been established by God on the Damascus Road. So keep in mind, this church at Jerusalem was not giving Paul any authority. They, they didn't have any authority. Paul had been given the authority on the Damascus Road. So the events here in Acts chapter 15 are only a confirmation to the Jews that Paul's ministry was just as valid and authoritative as that of Peter and the eleven. So notice what Peter says in verse 7. And when there had been much disputing, Peter arose and rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us? Now when he says men and brethren there, he's talking to the twelve apostles, or the eleven, because he's one of the twelve. He's one of the twelve. And notice what he says. You know how that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the gospel. Now you ought to think about that. How that a good while ago, God made choice among us, the twelve, that the Gentiles should hear the gospel by my voice. Well, what do you think that does to Acts, Matthew, Matthew 20, 19 and 20? Now think about that. If Matthew 19, 28 and 20 was a commission to go to the Gentiles, to the, given to the twelve, then what does this mean? Do you understand what I just said to you? That means the commission in Matthew 28, 19 and 20 primarily was given to the disciples to go to the twelve tribes of Israel, not only in their land first, but to the dispersed throughout the Gentile world. That's what they were supposed to do. But it became evident that the nation of Israel at home was not going to repent. So God said, okay, we'll change the course. I want you, Peter, to go to this Gentile family. Otherwise, that statement has no meaning. doesn't have any meaning at all. And I'll elaborate on that, but I want you to notice P Peter's words. God made a choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of God. Now that's significant in the light of this erroneous belief that God had given to the apostles in the so-called Great Commission of Matthew 28 orders to go and preach to the Gentiles. Well, if he'd, listen, if he'd given the orders in Matthew, uh, Matthew 20, uh, 19, uh, 28, 19, and 20 to go to the Gentiles, then what does this mean? It means nothing. So finally, God finally stepped in and made a choice and said, okay, Peter, I want you to go to the Gentiles, which he did, which he didn't want to do, did he? Well, listen, 
If that commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 had been understood that they were to go to the Gentiles, then why is Peter so reluctant? You say, well, Peter was prejudiced. He didn't, didn't want the Gentiles safe. Nonsense. Nonsense. Peter knew that the Gentiles were supposed to be saved. But the problem was that Israel was supposed to repent first, which they didn't. Which they didn't. All right. Now down in verse, uh, down in verse, uh, uh, matter of fact, it says that and all other, all others were Jews or Jewish proselytes. That is, uh, anyone, anyone uh, who, uh, <clears throat> until Peter received this vision in Acts chapter ten, not one Gentile had been preached to. All others were Jews or Jewish proselytes. Now that's something to think about. Look at verse seven again. <clears throat> Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter is quick to bring all true religion back to the heart because he says, God who knows the heart. And Peter had conceded that the, Gentile, that the hearts of the Gentiles, believers, are are just as precious to God, and that's a mistake there, precious to God as Jewish believers. God showed him that in verse 8. Notice what he says. And God which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did us. Notice again here in the book of Acts in chapter 15, in verse 9, he says that he put no difference between us and them. Notice it doesn't say he put no difference between them and us. He put no difference between us, the Jews, and them, the Gentiles. Now that's significant. Not only that, he looked down at verse, verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of God in the, and, and through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as what? Even as they. It's not they get saved even as we. It's we get saved even as they. So you have to believe and you have to be able to see that a great Dispensational change has taken place in this part of the book of Acts. And so the, the, uh, <clears throat> the attempt then, uh, uh, Israel, uh, Peter continued by declaring that God had put no difference between us and them. And this is certainly, as I said, a great dispensational change. God uh, had not the, uh, the intent of God from the beginning be to create a different and a separate nation. Of course it was. No nation was as different as Israel. It was by God's design. Israel distorted and misused this difference, but it existed nonetheless. But now God was removing that difference, and Jews and Gentiles both were being saved by faith. And it's significant that Peter said, us and them. You notice the order. Peter concludes his remarks with a question which was intended to rebuke those who attempted to bring the Gentiles under the law of Moses. He asked, Why would they tempt God by imposing on the Gentiles bondage which neither they nor their fathers could bear? God had demonstrated to the Jews and the Gentiles alike that the gift of the Holy Spirit was not by works. He was a gift to the Jews at Pentecost, and He was a gift to the Gentiles at Caesarea. And to reverse this was tempting or testing God's former works. Now these are Peter's last recorded words in the book of Acts. Peter has been the prominent person all through the Gospels and the book of Acts. Every time the three were mentioned, it's Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. Then when it's the twelve, it's Peter and the twelve. But this is the last time in your Bible Peter ever says anything, with the exception of the epistle, first and second letter that he wrote to the Jews that were scattered. But folks, you have to, we have to get this. The Jews had been offered one more time the kingdom of heaven. It was offered in the early part of the book of Acts. It became evident, and Peter was the, was the spearhead of all of this. He was the chief spokesman. He was the leader, but all of a sudden it became evident that the nation was not going to repent and God was going to set the nation aside. And Peter, their representative and the head, disappears at Acts 15. He's never mentioned again. Now you think about that. Well, what's Luke's purpose? Luke's purpose is to show you and me 
that Paul's ministry was just as valid and God sent as was that of Simon Peter. And that's what he's going to do. And so uh, this is, these are his last recorded words in the book of Acts. Peter, the prince of the apostles, the obvious leader and spokesman of the twelve, uh, the one that God used to open the door to the Gentiles, was admitting that God no longer needed Israel or Judaism to save Gentiles. He was conceding that the ministry of Paul was from the Lord of heaven as his had been from the Lord of earth. His statement, we shall be saved as they, is a purposeful attempt to ensure that the Gentiles are not placed in an inferior position to the Jews. It is not they will be saved as us. It is we shall be saved even as they. Now these are the last words of Peter. And the intent of the writer ought to be evident. Peter was an apostle to the Jews. His base of operation was Jerusalem. He had the authority to loose and bind. And that was granted by the Lord Jesus. He exercised that power of binding in the matter of Ananias and Sapphira. He now exercises the power of loosing. And this is the last recorded act of Simon Peter. Peter, Judaism, Jerusalem, and the kingdom of heaven, and the twelve give way to the apostle Paul, and they fade out of existence. They're gone. They're gone. It's not about them anymore. It's not about the twelve, not about Peter, it's not about Jerusalem, it's not about Judea, it's not about tongues, it's not about signs. It's about grace and Gentiles and the Apostle Paul. Now Paul and Barnabas stands up. Simon Peter's had his say, now it's Paul's say. So, so you'll notice <clears throat> um, in verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience as Barnabas and Paul declared. And by the way, notice the order, Barnabas and Paul. At Barnabas and Paul declared what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles. So that's basically what he says. They declare what wonders. And that's all it said. They declare to this Jewish assembly what wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles. Peter has established that God gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit without the aid of the Jews. Now Paul stands up and, and Barnabas and they declare how God has worked among them. And so Paul and Barnabas give a brief report on how God confirmed their ministry among the Gentiles with miracles and wonders. The reference to miracles and wonders was necessary and would confirm to the Jew, Jewish mind that God was working through Paul's ministry. The entire Jewish nation was built on signs and miracles and wonders. This was introduced through Moses, who was the head of their nation. Would you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22, please? 1 Corinthians 1, 22. I want you to see an important verse that you need to mark in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Notice what it says. It says, for the Jews require a sign. You see that? The Jews require a sign. You don't require a sign, and if you did, you wouldn't get one. But the Jews require a sign. Now, you might want to write down alongside that 1 Corinthians 14, 22. And those are two verses that you just kind of need to jump back and help you to understand something there. But this requirement was met at Pentecost and at Caesarea. And now in the ministry of Paul. Now, toward the end of the book of Acts, Paul's sign ministry begins to disappear. Did you know that later on the Apostle Paul can't heal anybody? He leaves a brother sick. He also says to Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake and you're often infirmity. And later on, uh, you'll find in the book of Acts, uh, we've already seen in the book of Acts the miracle of Peter being released from prison. And in the early part of the ministry here of Paul, we'll see him released from prison. There's an earthquake at Philippi and their chains fall off. But later on, Paul can't get out of prison. He can't get out. In fact, they keep him in a prison and finally they lead him out and chop his head off. Do you see how things are changing as you move through the book of Acts? And so, uh, 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 in verse 12, <clears throat> the apost and let me just say this for those of you taking the notes, that one must keep in mind that Acts is a transition book. There is a gradual fading of apostolic signs and a gradual revelation of the new dispensation. Verse 12, 
Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles. Then James stands up. We've had Peter. He stands up and he talks about how God gave uh, the Holy Ghost to the Gentiles there at, at uh, Caesarea without the aid of any Jews. Then we have Paul and Barnabas standing up talking about how God worked miracles among the Gentiles without the aid of any Jews. Now James stands up. And he's the last person. And remember, this is not the James the Apostle, one of the Apostles, because he's already been killed. We, we studied that. This is James, the Lord Jesus' brother. And he is the one now who seems to be in the, the leadership position at Jer Not even Peter, but James seems to be the key figure here at, uh, at Jerusalem. And watch what happens in verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken to me. Simon hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this I will return and build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. And I will build the ruin, I will, I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth these things. Known unto God are all of his works from the beginning of the world. End of quote. Verse 19. Wherefore my sentence is, James says, that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Do you see that? Now James says my sentence is, is that we don't trouble them. They'd been troubled. They were troubled by false brethren who went up and said, you have to get circumcised and keep the law of Moses or you can't be saved. James says, no way. God tells us very clearly in the Old Testament that he's going to save the Gentiles. Now I want you to get that. Peter knew that Gentiles were going to be saved. And James knew that Gentiles were going to be saved. And all the twelve knew that Gentiles were going to be saved. So this reluctance to go to the Gentiles in the early part of Acts is not a prejudice thing. That is not the issue. The issue is that something vitally important and scriptural was supposed to happen before the Gentiles got saved. Do you understand that? And the thing that was supposed to happen is just what it says in that text in verse 16. I will return. Well, he hasn't. And I will build again the tabernacle of David that has fallen down. He hasn't. And I will build again the ruins thereof and set it up. He hasn't. And the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called. This thing is a prophetic thing that would have happened had Israel repented. But they didn't repent. But James says, the scripture says that God is going to save the Gentiles, so we just better leave it alone. We don't fully understand, James is confessing, what is going on here. But the Gentiles are being saved and God gave them the Holy Ghost like He gave us at the beginning. We'd better stay out of it and leave them alone. You, get, you understand what I'm saying here? Leave them alone. Peter said, who was I to resist God? Okay. Now James, the brother of our Lord and one of the... One of the James, uh, James, the brother of the Lord and one of the apostles was killed by the sword. <clears throat> or the brother of John. The James here is the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of the book that bears his name. He held a powerful position in the church at Jerusalem and is the final spokesman at this conference. It's significant that Peter re requests that James be told in his uh, uh, prison epistle. Uh, it is significant that Peter requested that James be told about his escape from prison. We, we talked about that in Acts chapter 12 and verse 17. You'll notice that his name is mentioned with the brethren. James, not Peter, is the voice of authority here at Jerusalem Church. Later, while at Antioch, Peter ate with Gentile believers until he saw brethren coming from James. And in fear, he withdrew himself from the Gentiles. Look at Galatians 2 with me, will you? Let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. And let me uh, show you what goes on here. I say later, possibly later, maybe not later. But nevertheless, it happened. Look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, Paul said, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James. Now notice that. My point is he came from James. That shows you the important position that James is occupying at this time. Before that certain came from James. Why would he say from James? James. 
Well, evidently because James was the leader of the church at Jerusalem. And uh, certain brethren are coming up, and Peter's afraid they're going to go back and tell James, we saw Peter eating with Gentiles. So there in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So you can understand a little bit here that Peter is still not too comfortable eating pork with a bunch of Gentiles. Now, <clears throat> James then makes reference to Peter's ministry to the Gentiles. And then he shows that this action of Peter's is not inconsistent with God's mercy to the Gentiles or to Scripture. And what he does is he quotes the book of Amos in chapter 9, verse 11 and 12. Now listen carefully. He quotes this scripture to show that God is going to save Gentiles during the tribulation and the millennium. And that is what that passage is about there in Amos. It is not a prophecy or a reference to the church age. And uh, even in Revelation chapter, nine, chapter 7 and verse 9, it says, After this I beheld a, a, and lo, a great multitude. And that's in the book of Revelation in the middle of the tribulation. A great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and tongues as stood before the throne. And uh, this passage reveals that multitudes of Gentiles will be saved during the tribulation period as the gospel of the kingdom is preached throughout the whole world. Isaiah rejoiced. Would you turn to Isaiah with me? Isaiah rejoiced that, that the Gentiles will, be, will come and worship God at Jerusalem in the millennium. So what James is saying here is that the Bible makes it very clear that the Gentiles would be saved. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, Isaiah says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills. And by the way, that word mountain is his kingdom. And the hills are the little kingdoms, the governments of the world. And all nations, look at that, and all nations shall flow into it like a river flowing into the sea. And many people, that's Gentiles, will come and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hook. Nation shall not uh, lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So James is telling us that the book of Amos is prophesying that, that, the, that the Lord is going to return, that the temple is going to be rebuilt, that the kingdom is going to be established, and then the Gentiles who call upon my name are going to be saved. Uh, Revelation says that a great multitude will be saved, and Isaiah and many, many others verify that. So James is not saying, listen carefully, James is not saying that the call of Peter to open the door of salvation to the Gentiles or the special ministry of Paul was a fulfillment of those prophecies. That's not what he's saying. It is clear they were not. However, he is taking liberty with that which is revealed to show that it is not inconsistent with the nature of Scripture, with the nature <clears throat> of Scripture or of God. The quote by James is clear that it is a reference to the literal tabernacle that will be built in Jerusalem to which all nations will come and worship and pray. In Isaiah 56, 7, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice shall be accepted upon mine altar, which tells me that in the millennial kingdom they will offer burnt sacrifices. You see that? It says their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, and mine house shall be called a house of prayer by all people. So the Jews will reinstate animal sacrifices, and uh, they will be practiced in the millennium. In fact, there's going to be some kind of sacrifices going on in the tribulation period because the, the uh, Antichrist is going to put a stop to it. You see? So something is going to happen where the Orthodox Jews will get back to some form of sacrifice. And I don't know exactly what nature it will take, but I guarantee it's going to happen. And in the millennium here, we're told that it happened. Now, James concludes his decree here in chapter 15. You'll notice what he says. 
He says, My decree is that we trouble not the Gentiles who have turned to God. James has one concern, and that's a matter of testimony. Notice what he says. Therefore, James is careful to not lay any burden on these believers except, notice what he calls them, these necessary things. Watch what he says. Verse 19. Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. And later on, he calls these those necessary things. Now, the reason for that, of course, is because of testimony. He calls them necessary things. And he says that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. Now, the reason is obvious. The law of Moses was read throughout all the cities each Sabbath. The reason was obvious. There were Jews in every Gentile city, and the law of Moses was read in every Gentile city every Sabbath. And what did the Jews read every Sabbath? They had dietary laws. They couldn't eat blood. They couldn't eat things strangled. So, Paul, so J James says, my sentence is this that we ask these Gentile converts to abstain from these things because of what is read every Sabbath in the synagogue for testimony's sake. You understand? He's not imposing a law upon these people. That's not what he's imposing upon them. He's just talking about the necessary things for, for testimony's sake. The law of Moses was read in, throughout all the cities each Sabbath and because of testimony to the Jews in the world, these necessary things were requested. Would you go to 1 Corinthians 8 quickly? You need to see this. I want to show you something. This is right in line with what James is recommending to these Gentile believers. In James, uh, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and look at verse 13. Paul says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Now, Paul is not saying there's anything wrong with eating any flesh. I saw something the other day. Man, I just, it just grossed me out. It was in China. And I thought about Brother Reese and the Jacobs over there. And I just thought, man, I hope Brother Gary has to sit down to one of these. these and, and, but you know what they were serving? They were serving rats. And I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was on the menu. It was a delicacy. And I watched, you know, and then I saw it there in another part of the, part of the, uh, <clears throat> in Africa, uh, in this one city. They were taking rats, they killed the rats, they just threw whole rats in on the campfire. I mean, they cooked them, I mean, they didn't waste anything. And then they'd sit there and eat that thing, you know, I, this old boy, you, I saw it, put this rat head, in, mouse head in his mouth, you could hear it crunch, just like potato chip. But you know, <clears throat> you know, this thing is just all psychological, it's all in your mind. It's in mine too. <laughs> But you know what? If you knew what they put in a hot dog, you'd never eat another hot dog. <laughs> uh, yeah, you'd never eat another hot dog if you knew what they put in hot dogs. I used to work in a slaughterhouse. I really. And I, I can tell you gory blood and gut stories that just gross you out. I remember when I applied for a job there, you know, I went up in the cafe, up in the lunchroom. And I just filled out my application, applied. I was standing up there looking down on this, this floor where they kill all these animals and everything. And I was looking at him. Here's a guy in a pit with blood above his ankles. And, uh, and he's got a candy bar in one hand and a cup of coffee over here. You know? And boy, he's just doing his work. And I, I just grossed me out. But after I'd worked there a couple of months, I was doing just the same thing. You see? Now, so Paul says, all things are lo lawful for me. So it's testimony. That's the idea. In, you can eat anything you can thank God for. <laughs> Do you hear me? If you can really, in your heart, thank God for it, then you can eat it with no problem. But let's suppose uh, you're sitting there and you're about to eat something and some Gentile believer uh, speaks up and says, you know that was offered to an idol. Then Paul says, don't eat it. But not because of the idol. He says, you don't eat it because of the conscience of the man who said that. You get the picture. It's testimony. It's a testimony thing. I got another reference I want you to look, look, at, uh, look at. Would you look at Romans 14, 21? Quickly. I'm just about through here, and I want to finish this this evening. Um, in Romans 14, 21, look what he says. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor drink wine, 
nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or made weak. He says you don't eat anything. I wouldn't go into a Jewish new, new, new convert in a Jewish home and sit down or take him out for lunch and say, uh, you know, let's go over here to Tony Roma's and have some pork ribs. Well, we, it'd, be, it'd be acceptable, but it would be a poor testimony to him. You understand? That's what he's talking about. So when James says, Moses, the law of Moses is read in every synagogue, every Sabbath. And these things are read. Therefore, I think it's necessary that we write to these Christians who have been saved by grace and we suggest to them, this isn't a law that they have to follow, but he's recommended to them that they abstain from these things. Now, we know idolatry is not acceptable, we don't we? We stay away from idolatry. Uh, and we know that, uh, uh, you know that it's not too healthy to eat blood pudding and stuff like that. And if you kill an animal, you ought to drain the blood out of it. But there's not in every person that knowledge. Don't you understand that? You're in a Western society that was built on the Word of God. But I'll tell you what, you go into country. I've been in Korea. I walked down the streets of Korea. I walked down the streets of Korea, and they had dogs in cages. By the way, let me tell you what. First time I went to the Philippines, I went up to uh, Angeles City. It's, the, it's destroyed almost. The air base was destroyed and everything. But I was there when that thing was in full bloom and, the, and, and preached right next to the air base. I stayed with a missionary, uh, a brother Quinlan. He has a twin brother over in, in, uh, in, in, Sp in, Sp in Yakima as, who's pastoring. Homer Qu Quinlan is the pastor over there. His twin brother over in uh, Angeles City. And I stayed with him. Soon as I got out of the bus to go to his house, he told me, he says, jump in my Jeep. I got to go find my German shepherd. We never found him. At least we don't think we did. You know what he said to me? He said, if they catch my dog, they'll eat him. You don't find dogs running the street in the Philippines. No, you don't. And you don't find dogs running the street in a lot of places in Korea. Now, do you hear me? Now, I don't know if it is, would be any worse to eat a dog than it would a possum. Or any worse to eat a house cat than it would a squirrel. Now, I'm not, don't, don't worry, your cats are safe around me. And so's your dog. But I'm just wanting you to see that you may not be as sanitary as you think you are. I mean, you ever see anything dirtier than a chicken? Huh? You ever see anything dirtier than a chicken? I grew up on a farm. I know what chickens will eat, they'll eat anything. Do you know what a possum will eat? He'll eat anything. Anything. No an dead cow rotting down alongside the pasture. You go down there, you have to run the possum off. You want to get part of it, you got to run him off. He's got his head in there eating that thing. You know, I mean, really. You know, you wouldn't think about eating a slug. But you eat all kinds of things that come off the bottom of the sea and all kinds of stuff, you know. Not, and there's nothing wrong with it. But I, we're just a lot of self-righteous, pious people. We think, oh, no, our diets are just right. Theirs is strange. I heard a missionary one time. He, uh, he uh, <clears throat> went to a, a, to a place, and no one had ever been there. And uh, right outside this hut, this little village, it was just several people in kind of a village, there was a fence post. And this fence post outside this house was just glazed. It, just, it would shine. It was slick. And he had no idea what this fence post was. And finally he asked the guy, and he says, well, that is where we put our snot, mucus, for some of you. He says, what do you mean? And this guy just blew his handful of it and went over and wrapped it and wiped it on the post. He said, that's the worst thing. That's the worst thing I have ever seen. And the, mission, and the, and the native said, no, the worst thing I've ever seen is you white people... You take a little piece of cloth out of your pocket, and then you blow it full, and then you keep it. It's all in the eye of the beholder, you understand? Now that I've got you thoroughly sick here, I'd like to just kind of finish this up. So then, so then, uh, so what James does then is he concludes with a decree that we trouble not the Gentiles. And the reason is for testimony. Now, I'm down at the bottom of that page. He said, 
uh, we read that men of reputation and character were sent to accompany Paul and Barnabas as they returned to Antioch with this good news. Uh, these men that traveled were Silas and Judas. They are called chief men among the brethren. And this letter would assure all concerned that the, of the apostleship of Paul, that the apostleship of Paul was fully recognized by Peter and the eleven, James and the brethren. Those who had troubled the Gentile believers were subverting their souls and were not authorized by the Jerusalem church or the twelve. Gentiles were being told that circumcision and the keeping of the law were necessary for their salvation. It is evident that every God-appointed authority on the earth at that time disagreed with salvation by works, yet certain brethren were teaching it. It was an addition of works and with faith. And to do so would deny everything that Peter had witnessed at Caesarea and testified of. The teaching of the Judaizers was a complete contradiction to what God had revealed to Peter and Paul. Well, they get back to Antioch, Paul and Barnabas. The congregation was gathered. The letter was read. The result was a joyous conclusion. And we must commend, we must uh, comment on the effects of sound doctrine. It brings great joy to those who are saved and love the Lord Jesus Christ. You must think of the fear and the anxiety that these believers endured until they heard the truth about faith being complete, uh, being uh, completely apart from works. Notice that this salvation cannot be achieved by works, nor can it be lost without works. It is free and it is eternal. It is important that we note what James did not say when he wrote. He did not tell these believers that they had to keep the Sabbath to be saved. That eliminated the Seventh-day Adventists. He did not tell them they needed to be baptized to be saved. That eliminated the Church of Christ and 90% of Christendom. He did not tell them that they must eat the sacraments. That eliminates every Roman Catholic. In fact, there was not one thing they were required to do to be saved other than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The only request made by James was that, for testimony's sake, among the Jews, they refrain from those four things. In summary, the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit in this chapter is to establish the ministry of Paul to the Gentiles. The special call of Peter to Cornelius was intended by the Holy Spirit to confirm the new direction of the Lord and the call of Paul. Jesus had accused Jewish leaders of compassing land and sea to make one proselyte, and when finished they made him more the child of hell than themselves. This is just the situation that prompted the meeting at Jerusalem. Jewish brethren had traveled to the Antioch church to teach them that they must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses if they were to be saved. Paul and Barnabas went to Jerusalem to correct this matter. After testimony from Peter and Paul and James, it was agreed that Gentile churches should not have any unnecessary burdens imposed on them. Their only concern should be to present a good testimony to the Jews, and perhaps that would provoke them to salvation. Now folks, nothing has changed. There's always somebody, some group, somewhere trying to add one more thing to your conversion. And you know what the goal is? It's to bring you under bondage and under their control. People are afraid of liberty, but you have liberty in Christ. Now, your liberty is not a license to sin. Your liberty is a opportunity to do right and serve God. And testimony is what's important. That's how you win people to Christ, by your testimony. All right, let's bow in prayer. Our Father, thank you again for your goodness tonight. Thank you for, these, uh, for this passage of Scripture. And may we be grounded and settled in the truth, and may we not be shaken when cults and other groups come and try to impose upon us anything other than faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. Bless these folks, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.